So this is about where we left off. We were talking about macromolecules and I had quickly introduced uh, proteins. And uh, so I want to kind of get into proteins today and nucleic acids. And uh, this will wrap up this topic and we'll probably get a chance to actually start the next one as well. So this is the part I skipped, what do proteins do? Uh, it turns out proteins do quite a few things. And uh, this is uh, right from the textbook and it's showing you a big list of all sorts of functions that proteins do. And um, once we're done uh, going through this, I'll go back and we'll, uh, we'll make our notes uh, that we were continuing from last time. So first function, you can see our enzymes. You probably know that most enzymes are proteins and this is a huge, huge important function to your cells because of course uh, enzymes are allowing chemical reactions to occur and without chemical reactions, our cells would be nothing. Uh, some proteins are defensive proteins. You can see in this diagram, they're storing uh, antibodies. That's part of your immune system. Also very essential if you are a mammal to have a good immune system, particularly if you're trying to fight off any viruses. Uh, some proteins are for storage, so you can see there's a protein there showing that it's in storing uh, amino acids for chick embryos. Uh, some proteins are involved in transport. We're going to talk about transport proteins uh, when we talk about cell membranes. That's in topic uh, four, I think. Uh, some proteins are hormones, like insulin. Some proteins are receptors, so they're involved in... Uh, transmitting signals along your neurons and your muscles. Some proteins are part of muscles, so that's also very important. Again, if you're a mammal and you want to move around. And then some are structural. So we're talking about things like uh, collagen and uh, keratin, so things in your skin and your hair and things like that. Okay, so I want to go back to our little uh, note here. Uh, so these are our um, our macromolecules and uh, just fill in some information for proteins. I guess I haven't talked about what linkages for proteins yet, but I will fill that in. That is called a peptide bond for proteins and functions. I just gave a huge list of things. So see if I can remember some of them. We have enzymes, we have structural proteins like collagen. We have Uh, immune molecules, such as antibodies. I think my, uh, my document switched to French for some reason, so that's why all the words look like they're being spelled incorrectly. So, for some reason, my Word documents love to change to French and all my spelling is wrong. I don't know what I'm doing to make that happen. Uh, what else did we say here? We had uh, receptors, hormones, so a whole bunch of other things. Oh, and I'll put muscle. So I think there were eight things there. I think I remembered six of them. Big one that I do want you to know is this one here, of course, enzymes. Oh, and the other one, other big one, are, of course, transport proteins in membranes. So those are things we're going to talk a lot about in this class. Okay, I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint here in a moment. Um, if you missed all that, don't worry. I will come back to it when we talk about nucleic acids. So right back to our amino acids, this is where I left off. And if you remember last time, I drew you a little picture. I was trying to draw you a little amino acid. So it looks something like this. We had a carbon and we had a hydrogen. Over here, we have our carboxylic acid. Oops. Sorry, I've got to erase that. It should be a single bond. There we go. Single bond OH and a double bonded O. So that there is a carboxylic acid. Oops, carboxylic acid. And then we have an amino group, an H2. That's my amino group. So it's an amino acid. And then we have something called a side chain. And so, uh, as I had introduced last day, there's 20 amino acids and uh, they all have different side chains. 
Uh, you don't need to memorize amino acids in this class. Uh, you do need to know one of them, that's methionine. We're going to talk about that when we get to the genetics aspect of the course. But you can see most of them uh, end with an ene. They have three letter codes, they have single letter codes, and uh, quite a few different uh, chemical characteristics. So the ones we're looking at here are the hydrophobic ones. Hydrophobic meaning they do not dissolve in water. And uh, so they're going, if you hear uh, protein has hydrophobic amino acids, it's their protein itself is going to be hydrophobic or at least have hydrophobic components to it. Uh, here are the hydrophilic ones. So these ones are all polar and uh, highly soluble in water. If you take a look at the chemistry of these things, they have lots of oxygens or in some cases they have nitrogens and sulfurs uh, and that's what's going to make them hydrophilic or polar. Some of them have charges, so this can make them acidic or basic. If you take biochemistry, these ones become actually very, very important because uh, they're relatively reactive compared to the other uh, amino acids. So here's the stage where I'm showing uh, how we link our amino acids together and the production of a peptide bond. So there's that word that I added to the table, peptide bond. And you can see in that case, you have uh, two peptides attached together already. So that's a dipeptide. And then we have this third pep, uh, amino acid here, which is being attached. There's our water molecule there, two H's and an O. And water gets released, so some dehydration synthesis, and we're forming a new peptide bond. So I wanted to point out one other thing uh, with the structure of these, uh, just a little bit of terminology. Uh, if you take a look at our peptide down at the bottom, we have, there's my amino group right there. And my amino group, of course, has a nitrogen. So sometimes it's called the N terminus, N for nitrogen. And that's the beginning of a peptide chain. Over on the other end, my carboxylic acid is right here. I'm circling it. And you can see it has a carbon instead of a nitrogen. So this will often be called the C terminus, which is the end of the amino acid chain. So it's kind of like English. We read left to right uh, in the peptide language. We read from the N terminus to the C terminus. So proteins, uh, amino acids, are strung together at the ribosome. This process is called translation. So we will talk lots about translation later on. I think that's topic uh, maybe 13 or 14 or something like that. Maybe even a little bit later, maybe 16. Uh, and you can see the process there is involving transfer RNA and messenger RNA. And uh, so much, much more on that later. So I want to just talk a little bit about protein structure because uh, it's actually quite complex. And uh, so when we talk about protein structure, often we talk about uh, several levels of structure. Uh, the first level of structure is just the amino acid sequence. So this is determined by uh, the gene. So it's found uh, in, in the uh, gene is coded by the genetic code of the ribosome. And we get all these amino acids strung together. So if you take a look at this sequence, we have the lysine, proline, threonine, glycine, threonine, glycine, and so on. Uh, once it starts coming off the ribosome, uh, what you have are all these uh, intermolecular forces. So you've got, uh, what happens is uh, you've got these weak molecular forces, hydrogen bonds in particular, start to form between uh, the different amino acids in the strand. And two really common structures they make are these uh, alpha helices and these beta sheets. So you can see this alpha helix, I'm looking at the top, so it's a helix, it kind of swirls around like this. And between the strands, you can see these dotted lines. So I'll make some dotted lines here, are the hydrogen bonds. So kind of just, uh, you know, starts uh, raveling together in this three-dimensional structure. Uh, some strands form uh, uh, sh uh, sheets instead, and uh, those strands tend to have larger amino acids, so they're kind of bulkier and they don't twist into a nice little helix as easily. And you can see, again, we've got these hydrogen bonds between the, um, between the sheets in there. So it comes off the ribosome, starts folding into these alpha helices and these beta sheets, and eventually uh, you do start to get a three-dimensional structure, and this is called the tertiary structure. And this is going to include other intermolecular forces. So all of those things that you talked about in high school chemistry, we've got, uh, we've got uh, ionic forces. Uh, we have something called disulfide bridges. You can see two sulfurs 
can get together and, and attach to one another. Uh, and you also end up with hydrophobic interactions and uh, London dispersion forces uh, in the final fold of a protein. So this is called the tertiary structure. Um, we can draw every atom in a protein, uh, and it is very, very complex uh, and very, very messy. So generally, we don't do that, and we have different ways to represent protein structures. So here's some different ways to represent protein structures. You can see on the left here, I have a space-filled model, and that's where every atom is put in there. If you take a look, the carbon is black, and the oxygen is red, and nitrogen is blue. You can see a few sulfurs in there as well, which are, are yellow. Uh, and they're not even showing the hydrogens. You can see it's very, very clumpy, uh, a little bit messy. Uh, a cleaner way to show structure is called the ribbon model. And you can see the alpha helices are shown here in red. And they look like little spirally things. And then you've got the beta sheets here are in blue. And it's, it's a much, much cleaner uh, type of structure. Sometimes people are trying to highlight different things around their model and they might show this, uh, have this wireframe model as well. So any of these are acceptable. So if you see something like this, uh, it's, it's usually a protein. Uh, it's just they're trying to show it to you in three dimensions and, and give you this nice representation of it. So by the way, you could see something like this on a midterm uh, as part of a, a midterm question asking you what kind of structure this is. Uh, so something good to know. So some proteins, um, if you look at the structure, we've got the primary structure is the sequence. Secondary structure is when we start to form hydrogen bonds in alpha helices and sheets. Tertiary structure is the final kind of three-dimensional fold. Some proteins have what are called a quaternary structure, and that's where multiple subunits actually get together and form a, a larger complex protein. I'll show you a couple of examples here. Classic examples are hemoglobin and collagen. So hemoglobin has four subunits, and uh, so this molecule hemoglobin can actually carry four oxygen molecules. You can see in the middle of the hemoglobin, it's got uh, iron and heme, which is where the oxygen is carried. Uh, collagen is another uh, one that is actually three protein chains, and they sort of twist around each other like a little bit of a rope. And uh, collagen is found in your connective tissue. So there are tons of these proteins that have these quaternary structures. So I want to show you something on why protein structure is important and important to biology, important to uh, understanding disease. Um, this is a, a diagram from the textbook that's talking about uh, sickle cell disease and uh, what is going on uh, to the different aspects of the protein structure uh, when we have one amino acid changed. So take a look at amino acid number six. So amino acid number six here, this is normal hemoglobin, and it is a glutamic acid. So that's an acidic amino acid and has a negative charge. Somebody, uh, sometimes people have, uh, this is a genetically inherited disease, by the way. So sometimes people have a different amino acid there. You can see this is a valine. So a valine is a hydrophobic amino acid. So you're going from something that has a charge and is highly polar and soluble to something that is um, not soluble. Uh, it's hydrophobic. So if you take a look, here's what normal hemoglobin looks like. It's water soluble. It's in your red blood cells. It's floating around doing its job, uh, collecting oxygen from your lungs and delivering oxygen to your bodies. What's its function? Well, they, its function is to be soluble and carry oxygen. And as a consequence, uh, everything is good and your, your red blood cell has a normal shape. So that's what a normal red blood cell looks like right there. Uh, with the uh, mutated version, um, it turns out that there's a little, uh, kind of a little bit of a shape difference in the uh, hemoglobin and also a difference in the solubility. So hydrophobic things, you can kind of think of them as a sticky, uh, sticky little uh, proteins or sticky little amino acids. And uh, these um, uh, hemoglobin molecules actually stick together. So rather than being water soluble, they form these little uh, aggregates or these fibers. So they still bind oxygen, just not at high uh, capacity like normal hemoglobin. And the cells themselves uh, end up getting warped. And so they look like a sickle. If you don't know what a sickle is, let me draw one for you here up at the top. Sickle is this kind of thing here. It's got a stick, it's got a big blade. 
It's kind of like what the Grim Reaper is going to carry around. So that's a sickle. And uh, so these cells break down very easily too, and sometimes these people don't have enough red blood cells, and so that's why it's called sickle cell anemia. So I'll come back to this example later on uh, when we talk about uh, genetics and uh, when we get to that part of the course. Okay, so there's our cell. We're back to our cell again. Uh, it's got a membrane, it's got carbohydrates, and now it can do stuff. It's got enzymes that can move things around. It's got uh, uh, enzymes that can carry out chemical reactions. And the last part of this is, of course, how does our cell make things and how does it remember what to do for, from generation to generation? So, of course, we're going to talk about nucleic acids. Um, so, take a look at this diagram here. Um, I meant to break it down and actually show it in steps. Uh, so, I apologize for that. Um, but if you take a look at this diagram here, uh, let me just see if I can find a different version of this uh, PowerPoint, maybe. And uh, I know I have one that uh, kind of breaks this down into steps. So, let me just take a look here. Okay, yes, there it is. Okay, so let me just uh, put up a different PowerPoint for you. Um, okay, where is it? There it is. Okay, I just need to share that with you. There, that's a little less cluttery, so we'll start there. Um, so what are nucleic acids? Uh, Nucleic acids, uh, the name nu nucleic comes from nucleus, and, and they're, uh, they're acidic, so they're acids, but uh, they're, they're usually made out of uh, three components. And you can see those three components there in the middle. We have phosphate groups, we have actually a sugar, and we have nitrogenous bases. There we go. So this particular unit of a nucleic acid is called a nucleotide. Uh, you may hear other terms, you may hear nucleosides, and, and uh, there's, you know, some, some differences there that we're going to get into when we, uh, when we talk about nucleic acids later on in uh, the last uh, third of the course. Um, you probably know that these nitrogenous bases come in different uh, varieties. Uh, all the letters of the genetic code, so the A, C's, G's, and T's, and of course uh, U's in RNA, so that's uh, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Um, so you're probably wondering why are these called nitrogenous bases? Take a look at the word. Always look at the word and see if it gives you a clue. And you have nitrogen in there. So take a look. Lots of nitrogens. Nitrogen, nitrogen. Lots of nitrogens in these things. So they're nitrogenous bases. And uh, like I said, a good variety of these things. We also have uh, these sugars, um, these pento sugars. So pent, of course means five, and in this case here, we mean five carbons. So there's two varieties. We have ribose and deoxyribose. So if you take a look, ribose right here has this OH. Deoxyribose is missing the oxygen. So deoxy literally means one less oxygen on that thing. So I will um, uh, come back to nucleic acids, of course, much later on uh, in the semester, like I said, when we talk about genetics and things like that. Uh, some other pictures for you, and then I'll go back to my notes. So uh, nucleic acids, what are they doing? Of course, we have DNA, which is our genetic material. So this is for making uh, the blueprints of the cell, I guess you could call them, or the instructions for making proteins and, and other genes. Uh, DNA, of course, is double-stranded. Here's a picture showing DNA. If you take a look right here, we've got one nucleotide right there. And here's another nucleotide. And here's another nucleotide and so on. And on the other side, we have more nucleotides. And so we have two strands of nucleotides and those two strands are attached together by hydrogen bonds. I know I have some pictures here. Here's a kind of just a different type of graphic showing uh, the double helix of DNA. And here's a little animation showing uh, kind of one of those wireframe uh, stick figures of DNA. I know I have some more pictures of nucleic acids. 
Uh, I guess I don't have a picture of RNA. I thought I had a picture of RNA, but I do have uh, another nucleic acid that you may be familiar with, and this one is ATP. So ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, and uh, this is used for energy in the cell. And if you take a look at the components, it's a nucleic acid. You have a nitrogenous base, you have a ribose, and you have some phosphate. Okay, so I wanna just uh, go to our notes here and kind of finish off uh, this last part. So nucleic acids are made out of um, uh, nucleotides. Nucleotides, so nucleotides include nitrogenous bases, bases, we have pentose sugars, and we have phosphates. Okay, uh, I guess we're missing linkages. Let me just go back to the PowerPoint and see if it shows on the PowerPoint or not, the type of linkage. It's not showing the linkages, it's not labeled. I am not considering hydrogen bond a linkage. Hydrogen bond is just holding it together. Okay, so the linkages are called phospho, phospho diester bonds. So that's what's linking the nucleotides together, something called a phospho diester bond. And uh, I'll go back to the diagram just for a second to show you what that is. Assuming it shows it on there, phosphodiester bond is this linkage right here. So it's including that phosphate and these oxygens. But I won't be asking you to draw a phosphodiester bond. Uh, but it's good to know the name of what is linking the nucleotides together. Okay, and what are nucleic acids doing? Uh, nucleic acids, of course, include DNA and RNA. So uh, this it would include uh, information, uh, we'll call it storage and transmission. So DNA, of course, is more of the storage role and RNA is more for the information uh, transmission, we'll call it. And then we have things like ATP, but you can also have GTP and you can also have CTP and UTP. So it turns out ATP is just one of many of these types of nucleotides that are using energy, but we can use the other ones as well. They're just not nearly as common. And these are uh, transient energy sources in the cell. Okay, so I'll just give you a moment to uh, catch up to me uh, in case you're still trying to get those notes down. Uh, I'm almost on this topic. I just have a couple more slides to wrap things up, and like I said, we'll start uh, we'll start topic three. And I apologize. I guess I realized I had meant to, but I didn't post topic three PowerPoint. I'll do it. Uh, I'll do it right after the lecture here today. Okay, I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint. Hopefully, you got all that. So there's our nucleic acids. There's our ATP, keeping our cell happy. And uh, last thing to uh, kind of finish off this unit is uh, just to mention with DNA and RNA and proteins and how they're all connected uh, in these processes. So replication, transcription, and translation. We are gonna talk about uh, what those things are uh, in, in later units. Uh, in bacteria, of course, all these things are done in the cytoplasm. Uh, there's no compartmentalization in bacteria, so it's all done in the cytoplasm. In eukaryotic cells, these, thing, these processes are divided uh, into different compartments. So more on that later, like I said. Okay, so a couple other things just to finish off the topic is that uh, sometimes we can have macromolecules that are fused together. So if you take a look at this, uh, for example, we have a lipoprotein. So what's a lipoprotein? A lipoprotein is where we have a protein. So the second word, by the way, is usually the kind of the main component. So this is a protein that has a lipid attached to it. Uh, what about a glycoprotein? Well, again, that's another protein that has a glyco thing on it. And the glyco, if you remember, is a carbohydrate. Uh, a proteoglycan, in this case, the glycan is the bigger thing. And so these are carbohydrates with proteins attached to it. These are actually massive, massive carbohydrates. These you actually find in your joints. 
and uh, they're absorbing lots of liquid and they're, they're uh, kind of spongy materials that are helping your joints to, uh, to be spongy so that, you know, when you walk and jump, your joints don't hurt. And uh, sometimes people get injections of these proteoglycans to uh, help out the joints. So there's our cell, it's got a brain now, it's got some DNA, and it's ready to go. Of course, this doesn't include solutes and small molecules, but you kind of get the idea of what's going on with those macromolecules. Uh, there's a kind of a breakdown, uh, same breakdown I gave you before, and you can see there's our cell uh, all ready to go. Okay, so before we go to the next unit, I do have a Kahoot for you. So load up the app, and we'll play Kahoot. I'll, uh, I'll share this right now. I just gotta switch my screens. And where is it? Thought I had it loaded up. It's loaded up. I can't seem to find it. What did I do with it here? No, not that one. Okay, there it is, sorry about that. Okay, here it goes. Load this up. So by the way, with this particular Kahoot, I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of structures of uh, different types of macromolecules. It's really important that you do know um, the differences between the macromolecules. So I'll try to point them out as we go through this uh, Kahoot, and uh, hopefully that will help you uh, with your studying purposes. Uh, I've been trying to point them out as we, uh, as we cover them, uh, what they look like. Carbohydrates, for example, have lots of uh, alcohol groups, and uh, uh, proteins have uh, amino groups, and uh, Nucleic acids, of course, like phosphates and things like that are always good to look for. All right, give you another five seconds to get connected, and then I'm gonna hit start. All right, here we go. Question one. What category of macromolecule does this belong to? Okay, so two people got liquid and some people got carbohydrate. So let me just go back to the picture. I know this, that one was old, it was from a few days ago, uh, but the correct answer is lipid. So here's the picture. You're probably wondering what on earth is that thing? That is actually cholesterol. So that is a steroid. If you take a look at this molecule, there's one alcohol group on it. That's not enough to make it a carbohydrate. It's mostly carbon and hydrogen and that makes it a lipid. All right, so that was a tough one. Let's try the next one. What category of macromolecule does this belong to? Okay, so let's take a look at the picture again. Looks like that was another tough one. So what are we looking at here? This here is an amino acid. So it's actually very similar to what I drew on the board. Maybe the, uh, the uh, side chain is facing down instead of up. But this is an amino acid, so this belongs in the protein group, protein category. All right, these are not meant to be easy, so don't worry if you're getting them wrong. Uh, it just means you need to study a little bit and, uh, to get caught up so you can get this, uh, these questions right on the, on the uh, midterm. All right, next question. Here's another one. Which category of macromolecule does this belong to? Nucleic acid, good, we're doing a little bit better here. You're right, uh, here's the picture again. You can see that uh, this is actually, uh, I believe this is adenine. So this is one of the nitrogen spaces. All the nitrogens there are highlighted in the blue. 
Scoreboard, okay, Natalie pulls into the lead. Good job, Natalie. Question four, what category molecule does this belong to? Lipid is correct. Lots of people seem to like carbohydrates. They're not all gonna be carbohydrates. This one has one carboxylic acid uh, group on the left and the rest is all hydrogen and carbon. That makes it a lipid. So this is actually a fatty acid, this particular molecule. Okay, a couple more here. What category of macromolecule does this belong to? All right, I'm hoping this is an easy one. Okay, good job. People did a little bit better on that one. Let's take a look at the picture. It's a bunch of G's and C's and U's and A's. So this, in fact, is transfer RNA. So it's a nucleic acid. Scoreboard, moving back and forth. All right, question six. What category of macromolecule does this belong to? Okay, carbohydrate is correct. This, in fact, is sucrose. And if you take a look, look at all those OHs, all those alcohol groups. They're all over the place. It's a dead giveaway. Uh, usually carbohydrates are, are found in these hexagonal or pentagonal structures as well. So that's another dead giveaway for carbohydrates. Okay, I think there's one, maybe two more questions. Almost done. Two more. Okay, so this is a protein. Take a look at the picture there. Uh, it's uh, kind of cartoony. It's got all the uh, alpha helices uh, shown in these ribbon, these blue ribbons. Uh, this is actually a protein. I think this one here actually is a protein called myoglobin. It's found in your muscle. It's kind of like hemoglobin in your muscle. It holds on to oxygen. Okay, one more question and then we'll see who gets the grand prize. I don't know why Katie has a uh, flame beside her, but maybe just she's burning hot those last few rounds. Okay, it's a nucleic acid. Uh, this one has a phosphate and a sugar and a nitrogenous base. All right, let's see who has the top score here. Third place, Drara. Second place, AA. First place, Katie, yay, well done. Okay, so that was a little bit of a hard one. Um, do make sure you start reviewing your chemistry on these things because uh, things will start to get a little bit harder starting in the next unit. Uh, probably a lot more material, um, new material, uh, things you have not seen before. So it is important that you, uh, uh, you do start to, to study a little bit because we do have our midterm is coming up in two and a half, three weeks, somewhere in there. So you do want to uh, make sure you are ready to go. Okay, so let's see here. I'm gonna just start up the next topic and introduce the next topic here. Uh, let's see here. Share it, okay. I think I got it right here. There we go. Okay, so topic three, uh, we're gonna talk a lot about microscopy. And uh, actually, we'll be talking about microscopy uh, for next week's lab as well. So got lots of great pictures to show you. And uh, it's really unfortunate uh, we can't uh, share these experiences in the lab. There's some really cool things we, we see in Biology 107. Um, 
So if we are face to face next semester, ask me and I'll show you some cool samples at some time and, and uh, bacteria and other things. Um, so let's talk about the microscope. So microscope, uh, a very basic microscope is really three things. And actually you can see two of them here. Uh, one is your specimen or object. So there's number one. Um, two, you need some sort of lens. And then three, which I think is going to show up if I click my mouse, are actually those lines. So this is an illumination source. So you can call it light, but not all microscopes use light. Uh, a lot of microscopes are using uh, electrons, or they might use ultraviolet rays, illumination source. There we go. So the uh, illumination source is going to go uh, through or around the object. It's going to get magnified by the lens, and you're going to get an enlarged, enlarged object, uh, or at least a perceived enlarged image. And uh, there's our little character there. You can see he looks a little bit bigger. So I showed you uh, before the scale of the universe and how for cell biology, uh, we really are looking at a lot of things that uh, you can only use, a, you can't see with the unaided eye. So in this case, we're looking at a lot of things like this in cell biology. We've got cells, we've got nuclei, we've got organelles. And in fact, some of these things are so small that we actually need electron microscopes to actually view them. So we're going to talk about different types of microscopy, light microscopy and electron microscopy, and uh, uh, hopefully learn a little bit about these, uh, these different techniques. So uh, way back in topic one, uh, we saw a couple of different types of microscopes. Uh, we saw this one here. This is the one that Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek had, which is really basically a sophisticated uh, magnifying glass. And I also showed you this picture here. This was the one that Robert Hooke had. And uh, it's a little bit better. It's actually a compound microscope with two lenses. And uh, most microscopes now are what we call multiple objective compound lenses, meaning that uh, this lens here, the objective lens, can get changed. So bigger ones and smaller ones, depending whether you want to zoom in or zoom out. So that one shown there is actually a pretty basic kind of cheap one uh, microscope. And I'll show you at some point. Uh, uh, what our microscopes in the biology lab look like. So here's kind of the innards of a compound microscope. And I want to point out a couple of things. Sometimes they're called a compound light microscope, I'm emphasizing that there's a light source in them. So right here, we have a light source. Uh, let me just go back to the previous slide here. Uh, if you take a look at um, Hooke's microscope, what you're looking at here, you're probably wondering what this thing is. This is an oil lamp. So he was using an oil lamp. There were no light bulbs back in Robert Hooke's day. An oil lamp and a mirror to try to illuminate the specimen. Nowadays we have electricity, so we have light bulbs, which are a lot better. Um, other thing I want to point out here is something called a condenser lens. So the condenser lens actually focuses the light on the specimen just to give you more light. Then we have the stage here. This is where the uh, slide is going to go. The light goes through the specimen. And then right here, we have these objective lenses. Like I said, we can change up the magnification on those things. Uh, most microscopes now have a little bit of ergonomics built into them. So you can see that prism is making it a little bit more comfortable. So your head has, doesn't have to be directly above the specimen. You can sit at a chair and uh, take a look through the uh, ocular lenses, the eyepieces. So here are the microscopes uh, that we use, and um, I'll give you a bit more introduction to it next, in next week's lab uh, when I have one in front of me, and I'll show you uh, some of the different parts on it. Uh, one thing that we are going to use uh, in lab four is we're going to use a technique called oil immersion. I'm not going to really go into that right now. Uh, what I will do is uh, uh, for lab four, I'll give you a little demo how oil immersion works and what that's all about. So what I want to talk about today is um, what we can use in microscopy to get good images. Um, you probably know there's, you could go and buy a microscope at Walmart in the toy section and you know, you're going to pay maybe 40, 50 bucks for, for that and maybe a hundred dollars for an expensive one. And you know, is it, is it going to be as good as this one? 
Probably not. Um, this was 10 times out of mount or 100 times out of mount. I think they were worth about five or $8,000 for, for one of these uh, microscopes. Uh, they're very expensive. Uh, and there's a lot of good reasons uh, behind that. So how can we get better images? Um, three variables here to look at. Uh, magnification, resolution, and contrast. So let's let's talk about those uh, and what those are. I think I have some slides for each of these. Hold on a second. Okay, yeah. Um, so what's magnification? You probably have a, um, a cell phone, and you know you probably have a zoom function on your cell phone. You can magnify something. That's actually not hard to do digitally, but the image doesn't necessarily get better. But you are that's what you're doing when you zoom in. You magnify something. Uh, how do we do this on a microscope? Uh, really, just the size and the shape of the lens. So if I go back to my image here of my microscope, you may notice that you know this lens here is bigger than this one behind it. And uh, so bigger chunk of glass, it's kind of like having thicker reading glasses. Uh, the thicker the glass, uh, the, uh, the higher the magnification. Uh, this has a lot to do with the shape and the size of the lens. And so that can be done. And in fact, uh, a Walmart microscope may even have different lenses with different magnification. Image may be crappy, but uh, you still can, can improve that. So second thing here, which is, which is where you start to look at greater expense in our microscopes, is this thing here called resolution. So what is resolution? Resolution is uh, kind of like, uh, it means clarity or it means the minimum distance between two distinguishable points. So let me show you an example of resolution. So here are um, the same specimen, and you can see uh, it's the same magnification, it's zoomed in the exact same amount, uh, but we have uh, two different resolutions. So notice the one on the left. Uh, you can see the images, you can maybe make out some individual cells, but barely. In that case, the resolution is two micrometers. In the microscope on the right, the resolution is much sharper, and you can see we've got a much smaller number, so 0 0.2 micrometers. So which one has a better resolution? Obviously, the one on the right. It's more clear. I can distinguish each cell as unique and distinct. So that's what resolution is. I think I have a cartoon dealing with resolution here. You can see there's the far side, and they're looking at a slideshow and he says no wait that's not uncle floyd who's that hmm i think it's just an air bubble so resolution is clarity so how do we improve resolution this is the big one here the type of lens material so what uh what material do you think a microscope in walmart is made of probably plastic right and you probably know that plastic is usually not as good as other materials in a lot of ways. So what kind of uh, lenses do we have in the Biology 107 uh, microscopes? Uh, we actually have quartz. So plastic is the worst, glass is somewhere in the middle. Quartz lenses are actually uh, one of the best, uh, although it makes them very uh, expensive, unfortunately, for us. Uh, but you get a much, much sharper, cleaner image. Notice this other note here, use a smaller wavelength. That's how you get better resolution with electron microscopy. So a little bit more on that. Uh, I guess we'll probably get to electron microscopy until next week. Uh, the last variable is contrast. So what is contrast? Contrast is the ability to make out uh, the edge of something. So let me show you a picture here. So if you take a look, we've got um, the cell. And on the left, you can, you can make out the details really nice. In fact, I can, I can make out the nucleus. Um, but the, the, the color of the cell and the background are similar. So it's just not quite as, it just doesn't jump out to the eye as much. Uh, so you put a stain on it, and the stain, uh, it makes it much sharper. Uh, it jumps out to the eye. It's very easy to make out the details a lot better. And so how do we improve contrast? We stain things. Um, Pretty, pretty straightforward. So what are stains? Stains are usually charged molecules, and the charge is complementary to whatever is being stained in the cell. So DNA, for example, is usually negatively charged, and therefore stains that bind DNA usually have a positive charge on them, and so on. There's many, many types of stains. You can actually buy these thick, thick catalogs with thousands of different chemicals that will stain all sorts of different uh, biological molecules. 
to be used for um, microscopy. Here's another picture. Um, this is uh, an organism called Giardia. I'll spell that out for you. Giardia lamplia. So this organism, this organism is known for giving you traveler's diarrhea. So if you get traveler's diarrhea and you come back and you still have it for two weeks, it's probably Giardia. Um, kind of a cool looking organism. It's got two nuclei and then some flagella. So it sort of, so it sort of look like you know, little crazy aliens. Uh, so I thought I'd show you that picture. It's a very nice picture. Um, it says staining may require fixation. Uh, sometimes that means you have to kill the organism uh, in order to stain them properly. And so some stains are on dead organisms and some stains are on living organisms. Uh, we are going to talk about the gram stain. Uh, when we talk about bacteria. And uh, so a little bit more on the Gram stain. Uh, this is the guy, Graham, who named the Gram, who the Gram stain was named after. And uh, this is one way we can identify bacteria is we can actually uh, divide them into two main groups. So the Gram positive bacteria are bacteria that pick up the purple stain. And we'll talk about what that looks like uh, a little bit later on, and then the other group are called the gram negative. They don't pick up the purple stain, so we stain them with the second color, which is uh, which is pink. Okay, so I'm going to stop there um, with the gram stain. Uh, I don't want to get into the fluorescent stuff. I'll save that for next day. Uh, that's basically uh, finishes today's lecture. Uh, so we are going to talk about microscopy, like I said, uh, when we um, do next week's lab. And so by then we'll be done this lecture and uh, you'll have a bit more information behind, uh, uh, behind what you're doing for, for next week's lab. Um, so I don't uh, think I have anything else for, for you today. Uh, if there's any questions, let me know. If not, I'm gonna I'll end this, uh, this meeting here in a moment. And uh, hopefully you had a great week and hopefully have a great weekend as well. All right, take it easy.